Praise the name of Jesus. Amen. So there's a, a little quote that I read the other day, and I thought it was kind of funny, and I think it can really apply to us. Um, it reads as this, I'm so glad that God chose me before I was born, because I'm not sure if he'd want me after I've done some living. Uh, I didn't get any laughs, but that's okay. You guys are all saints from birth. Amen. Praise God. Um, Today's sermon title is Be Careful Christian. Uh, It's going to be a little bit of a different style of teaching. Um, We're going to go verse by verse through Thessalonians chapter 1. I've done this before. I know you guys know what verse by verse is, and I just pray that it blesses you guys. Um, So if you have your Bible, open up 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, starting at verse 1. We're going to start right there. Um, I'll read through it, and then we will say a prayer and dig into the word. Amen. Praise God. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father the work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake, and you become imitators of us and of the Lord. For you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you become an example to all the believers in Macedonia and in Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols, serving the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. Lord, Father, we thank you for this word. Lord, this is your word. I pray that tonight your word would do its work in our hearts. As we're here today, Lord God, to hear you speak and your word and what you have to say to us tonight, I pray that you would prepare every heart for the word. Let it have its work and let it not return back to you void. In Jesus' mighty name, we thank you and we glorify you and we rejoice in you, amen. Amen, praise God. So, again, Different style of teaching. I hope that uh, we understand this. I hope that we are all ears. And if you have a notepad, grab a notepad. If you have your Bible, open your Bible. Um, Praise God. Let's dig in. Amen. So verse 1, Paul, Silas, and Timothy to the church of the Thessalonians in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. So after Paul and Silas are... uh, get out of that prison, uh, the Philippian prison, by the way of an earthquake, which was a miracle, right? Um, They traveled to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. You can read that in Acts 17. Um, The church at Thessalonica was comprised of Gentiles who had turned from idols to God and Jews, recognizing their Messiah, believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want us to understand how how Paul starts this message to the Thessalonians, grace and peace. He does this multiple times in multiple books in Galatians, Colossians, Philippians, Ephesians, Corinthians, grace and peace. He links grace with peace because man cannot experience peace, true peace, right? Not the peace that this world, you know, gives you as a counterfeit, But true peace, which is the result of learning and understanding our salvation in Christ Jesus and him alone. It's a key point 
in the Bible. It's a key point. This is God's word. This is his, his inspired word. And we should pay attention to this. It is important. Grace and peace. Verse 2 and 3 says, We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father the work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is where we're going to get a large chunk of the meat of our text, of our teaching tonight. Work of faith, labor in love, and hoping for the return. Now I call this sermon, Be Careful Christian, kind of singular, but if you read this text as a whole, it talks about uh, an exemplary church. Because Paul is writing this, he's no longer there, but he's writing this letter back to uh, the church in, in Thessalonica, exhorting them for staying true in these three key points. So then why do I call it Be Careful Christian? Why don't we call it Be Careful Church? Because I want you to understand that you are the church. You know, there's a brother, uh, Cornell, that always says, you know, uh, something his father would say. What would the church look like if everyone in the church was exactly like you? How often do you reflect Christ? How often do you, do you proclaim your faith? Do you have works of faith? How often do you labor in love for one another without grumbling and complaining? And how, how often do you think of the bigger picture, that Jesus is coming back? How often do we hope of his return? A mature church will possess these three characteristics Paul saw in the Thessalonian church. First one, first point here. A mature church demonstrates work of faith. Work of faith. In John chapter 6, the disciples asked Jesus, what must we do to be doing the works of God? What do we do to do works of God? What do we do to serve God? And Jesus answered them, this is the work of God, that you may believe in him who has sent in whom he has sent. So believing in Jesus, right? When you come to Christ, it's a work of faith. By grace, through faith, right? Do we have faith as a church? Do we have faith in Jesus Christ personally? Do we hope for his return? Do we, have, do we labor in love? Be careful, Christian. Don't fall to the lies of the devil that will tell you that you're not enough, that you aren't really saved, that you're not really going to heaven. If you have a moment in your life where Jesus Christ touched your heart, where Jesus Christ moved in you, you accepted Christ as your Lord, as your Lord and Savior, this is a work of faith. This is, this is him who, who saved you. You meet Jesus and, and you're now saved. And we're going to go into this a little bit further when we, we start talking about um, hoping for the return. Second, a mature church labors in love. If we really, really, really believe in Jesus, if we really, really are in love with Christ and serving Christ, this is something that's unavoidable. It should pour out of us. Um, there's a story of a reporter in the 1940s that went to an orphanage and he went to an orphanage and he's doing you know, a report, writing things down, his observation, making something, I don't know, for a newspaper, right? And he sees this young boy, a 10 year old boy carrying a much larger and taller, older boy on his back, just carrying him around casually like it's, like it's nothing, you know? And some of us go lift weights to try to be able to carry something. Um, and he's just casually carrying this, this, young, this older boy on his back. And the reporter goes up to the young boy and says, hey, isn't he heavy? You know, you're carrying him around all day, isn't he heavy? And, and the young boy um, turns to the reporter and he says, he's not heavy, he's my brother. Do we labor like that in love? You know, whenever uh, somebody's asking you to carry uh, uh, their guitar or something to their car, help, helping someone out in, in a church, and, and sometimes it's so burdensome. Be careful, Christian. Are you laboring in love? Do we, are, are we always like, we get so, we, we grumble whenever we have to help practically anyone. 
And I, and I found this true in myself as well sometimes where it, it, cause it can be an inconvenience. But the truth is that it was an inconvenience for Jesus to go die for you. And I know I'm not trying to, you know, throw that in to make it extreme and make us feel guilty, but it's a truth. It's a truth. He did this for us, and if we really have a relationship with him, this should pour out of us, laboring in love. He's not heavy, he's my brother. Is it a burden for you to to welcome a newcomer into the church, to go sit by them, to go talk to them, to, to leave your friend group for one Sunday out of God knows how many we're gonna have, praise God, and go and talk to someone new, make them feel welcome, do the work of God, labor in love. Husbands to wives, are you laboring in love? Do you, do you love your, your wife like Christ charged you to do as he loved the church and gave his life for it? You know, wives, are you still building your house? Are you still supporting your husband and submitting and, and, and doing what you're called to do as, as a wife? Are you laboring in love in your marriage? Be careful, Christian. And what, you know, I say a mature church A mature church will have works of faith. A mature church will labor in love. A mature church will um, hope for the return. Uh, The age of a church doesn't really dictate its maturity or, or how solid its doctrine is necessarily. We've seen churches, you know, who have been going for a long time and just fall astray and, and, you know, go LGBTQ and woke and then they burn down and, and they might wonder why. And we're over here like, well, the Bible, you know, the Bible's pretty clear and, you know, God's word does not return void. Praise the name of Jesus. Um, again, don't let your heart grow cold. Don't let your heart in, in the church, in the very church, in these very walls where Christ has called you to, called you to reside, where, where we come to fellowship with, with one another, don't let your heart grow cold. Labor in love. Just because you've been going, you know, you could be going to church your whole life and still be maybe even worse than you started. Do we labor in love? Are we looking for him? Are we seeking him? And third, a a mature church will patiently hope for the return of the Lord. Knowing that we're going to heaven is a key ingredient of our maturity as a Christian because you see the bigger picture. Your mind is not just set on the car or the business or the school or, or your friend group or your stature, your popularity. Your mind is not just set on, on, on things that are temporary in this world. Your mind is set on, hey, he's coming back. He's coming back. It's, it's, not, a, it's not an if, it's a when. He's coming back and, and uh, he's gonna come back and, and I wanna be ready. I wanna be not caught off guard. The Bible tells us that he's gonna come back like a thief in the night. We're not gonna know, nobody knows. Not even Jesus himself knows, but God's gonna send him down to take his bride. Are we hoping for that? Does that scare you as a Christian or are you hoping for that? Because that that should be a blessed hope, right? Hoping in Jesus Christ and his return. It should be our hope. And hope used to, you know, hope used to mean something. You know, now we're, we use hope and, and it degrades it, the word the way we use it. You know, are we gonna start on time? I hope so. You know, are, is everybody gonna be on time at practice? I hope so. And we use it almost like a doubtful term and, and uh, it doesn't do it justice. Hope used to mean something. Does it mean something to you? Do you have hope in Jesus that he's gonna come back as he promised? Be careful, Christian. Verse four, as we continue through the Bible. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you. He has chosen you. The election of God is not a matter of the Lord casting his vote on our behalf because he sees something that impresses him. But God chose us before the foundation of the world. Again, kind of speaking to that quote I started with, before you were born, God, God has a plan for you. God wants you. He puts you on this earth for a reason. There's a purpose for your life. You're not too young. You're not too old. God has a purpose and a plan for your life. 
Has anyone ever heard of Ironside's door? Nobody. Because there's, okay, so there's like, let me, I'm going to give a short version, but there's also, you know, chosen, not chosen. It brings up the whole um, Arminianistic views, Calvinistic views, and everybody's tripping over nothing. Um, we got to save souls. We're not necessarily here to hack each other up with doctrine. We're here to save souls, and we're here to worship God. Um, imagine a door. A picture a door, right? The Bible says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one enters here but by me. The door is Jesus. Imagine a door, and, and you're in this hallway, and you're passing by this door on your right. And on that door is a, is a little sign engraved in it says, whosoever will, let him come. Now you can pass by that door and, and never know what's on the other side. Or you can enter into that door and let's say you enter into that door and it shuts behind you and you look back at the door and on, on the other side of the threshold, on the other side of the door, there's another sign. And the sign reads, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world and your name under it. How would you have known? How would you have known that you were chosen if you never entered? There's another uh, preacher that I listen to that he says, you know, how do you know if you're chosen or called? Um, if you respond to the call, you're chosen. If you don't respond to the call, you're not chosen. I hope that simplifies it for us to understand. You know, God does want fellowship with you. God has chosen you. He, he, he created you for a reason and he has a plan with your life. Should we choose to accept? Hallelujah, praise God. Verse five, first half of verse five, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit with full conviction. In Acts 1.8, it said that Jesus promised his disciples, you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you to be my witnesses. So not only was this church uh, having acts of faith, works of faith, not only were they laboring in love, not only were they hoping for Jesus Christ to come back, hoping for the return of Jesus, but they were full of the Holy Spirit. They were full of God's power to carry out these very things. They were empowered. Are you empowered in your daily walk with Christ? You are the church be careful, Christian. Are you trying to depend on your own righteousness? Are you trying to depend on your own finances or your own ideas or plans? Or are we relying on the Lord? Are we giving it to Christ? Are we, are we making room for the Holy Spirit to live a Christian life through us or are we getting in the way? Sometimes we get, get in the way of ourselves and we, we don't end up getting where we, where we think we wanna get and then we get frustrated and then we come back to God and say, Either, you know, you can, you can benefit from your trial or you can take the worst from it. It's your choice. You, know, you could get mad at God and shake your fist and call it quits, or you can come to Jesus and say, Jesus, I tried it and it didn't work. I'm coming back to you. Help me, Lord. And let's move forward. That's what God wants. God wants you to run back to him. Second half of verse five. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. Paul was running from place to place, dodging persecution. People were hunting him down, wanting to, wanting to put him in jail. You know, he just, he just escaped out of jail, and they're trying to get him back in jail. They're trying to capture him again. They're trying to catch him again, but he's out there preaching the gospel, planting a church while he's out of prison, you know, and, and the church is going well. And this is the example he's, he's sharing. And in verse 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you have received the word in much affliction and with the joy of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I loved what Brother Manu told us today, joy. If you ever meet a Christian that's, that's just constantly grumpy, you know, there's, there's no smile on his face, there's, you know, only grumbling, only seriousness, there's no, there's no humor. Praise God, Sam has a sense of humor, hallelujah. <laughs> if you were there yesterday, you know, praise God. Um, where's the joy? Where's the fruit? You know, the, the, whole, the, the fruits of the Spirit is love, joy, right? Joy. Praise God that we can rejoice in him. The joy of our salvation, Jesus Christ, and the hope of his return. 
but it says here something, something I want to dig in just a little bit more. You received the word with or in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Have you ever noticed that sometimes when, when you come to Christ or when God kind of gets a hold of your attention or your life or your soul, um, sometimes it's in, it's, in a, it's in a dark place. Sometimes it's when your mind is not right. Sometimes it's, it's when you're, you're, you're in the pit, when you're in the miry clay, whenever you're frustrated and you have nowhere to go and nothing to do, no, you don't have a vision anymore, you feel worthless. But whenever Christ comes down and saves your soul and gives you that joy, it's not like all of a sudden you're rich, you're famous, you got everything you need, you're empowered, you got a business that's... that's uh, just booming, you know, you, you got all your friends around you, you're married, you're loved, you have kids, it doesn't happen, you know. But in the middle of your trial, in the middle of your struggle, in the middle of where you are, there can be joy. You know, the joy of the Lord is not circumstantial. I loved what you said, Manu. Praise God. It's like, think of it like this. I gave this image at camp. Think of it like a championship football game. It's two teams. I've been working hard all season. They're coming off head to head. They're battling it out. They're playing hard. They're, they're putting it all out there. And there's, you know, helmets are cracked. You know, uh, bones are broken. Bruises are had. Hair is pulled out. There's teeth on the field. Fingers are dislocated. And people are hurt. And concussions are had. But when your team wins, that sweet taste of victory, you worked hard, your legs hurt, you're tired, you're out of breath, but when that sweet taste of victory comes, you're not thinking about your pain, you're not thinking about you know, what, what, what's been going on, what's, what's happening, the, the hurt, the broken bone, or the leg, you know, that'll pass. You kind of get an idea, okay, that's gonna pass, it's okay, hard season, but look, we, we did it, we made it. And I want you to know that that's kind of like our spiritual life as well. We get, we get beat up, sure. We go through battles, yes. There are trials and tribulations, of course, to mold us. But when you start to see the Lord's presence in the midst of all of that, when you start to, to, to see Jesus Christ in the midst of your trial, there's a joy. There's a bigger picture. There's the joy in the knowledge that we're headed to heaven, that we have salvation. Be careful, Christian. You know, the sin of a Christian is the thief of the joy of a Christian. Be careful in your walk with the Lord. Be careful in your, in your daily conduct. Search for righteousness. You know, on Thursday night, uh, Pastor Yosef spoke on, on when you hunger and thirst for righteousness. The Bible says that you will be satisfied. Are you satisfied? If you aren't, maybe we should ask ourselves, are we seeking, hungering, thirsting for righteousness? Verse seven and eight. So that you became an example to all believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord surrounded forth, sounded forth, from you to Macedonia and the Chaya, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that, so that we need not say anything. You know, the Pharisees back in those days, those days that used to toot their own horns, um, but the Thessalonians, they, they trumpeted the sweet song of salvation to such a degree that everyone in the Greek peninsula heard about their radical faith. Be careful, Christian. Do people know you're a Christian? Be careful, Christian. Are you showing your faith at work? Are you showing your faith to those around you? Are you showing your faith in church even? Are you cutthroat? Are you ruthless? Are you rude? You don't care about people? Be careful, Christian. This is not Christ. You know, I was at, I was at work one day and... Uh, there's an elevator and we're going up in the tower to work and uh, there's one chair in that lobby. It's kind of standing around over there. Everybody's got their tools on and uh, I was standing around over there. I was gonna sit down and I noticed this guy kind of 
creeping up on me. You know, I, know I, knew, I already knew he wanted the chair. Sometimes the elevator takes a little longer and we get to sit longer and get paid, so praise God. Um, and uh, I knew he wanted it, so I didn't sit down and I, and I passed by the chair and he kind of he like jogs up and sits down you know, on the chair. And he's like, huh, you know, I got the chair, you didn't. He's kind of being funny, you know. And uh, I turned to him and I said, it's okay, I knew you wanted the chair, so I didn't sit down. He's like, oh, really? I was like, yeah, I did. And he goes, what, are you a Christian? Are you a believer or something? You know, I wasn't even necessarily trying to show Christ, but Christ was shown. Praise God, amen. Sometimes it's the other way around, let's be honest, but... Um, is that you? Is that us? Do we show Christ? It says that, it says that Paul didn't, it says that they didn't even have to go out and preach it. It was already heard. The move of God at Passion for Christ Church, the move of God in the youth, is that heard throughout the other churches, throughout the other nations, throughout the neighborhoods? Is it, is it mentioned? Is it heard? Do people know at work that you're a Christian? Do people know um, wherever you go, when you're in church, when you're at school, do people know you're a Christian? Is it heard? Is it noticed? Be careful, Christian. Verse 9 and 10. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and wait for his Son from heaven. In verse 3 in Thessalonians, same chapter, or, uh, right up above, Paul says, you turned to God from idols, which is your work of faith. You serve the living God, which is your labor of love, and you wait for his son from heaven, which is the patience of hope. These are the three points, again stated. Be careful, Christian. Are we showing works of faith? Are we laboring in love? Are we hoping for his return? The idea of waiting does not infer apathy. In the Greek language, the word is used to describe what a mother does when she is anticipating the birth of her baby. She readies the nursery and eagerly prepares for his arrival. So too, we should say Jesus Christ is coming. The Lord is coming back. I need to make sure my family and friends know. I need to make sure they're ready. Is that you tonight? Don't take your eyes off the bigger picture. There's more to this walk with Christ than just your daily decisions and your career and what you want to do. But he's coming back. The Bible tells us that. Are we ready? Are we thinking about the bigger picture you know, back when I was working in the tower, I, 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 sometimes I mention, I mention a lot about my work in, when I'm up here, but I refuse to go through life without looking for Christ and examples of him in everything I do. So um, I remember Albie, one of my leads, would always drill it into my head. Think of the whole process. Think of the whole process. Before you do anything, think of the whole process. What does that mean, start to finish, what's going on? What do I need? What's the process? And I want to remind us tonight, are you thinking of the whole process? You were born in sin, Christ saved you, you're serving him, and we're going to heaven. Are you thinking of that? Are you keeping in mind that there's more to life than just, than just a Sunday church service? There's, there's more to life than, than uh, your friend group and, and the cars and, 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 and even a marriage. You know, you know your mar yes, it's important. Yes, your marriage is important, but that's not the, the relationship that Christ is most concerned with. An unmarried life is not an unfulfilled life. Do you have Christ living in you? Are we keeping our eyes on the bigger picture? And we're going to close here soon. The last half of verse 10. Whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. From the wrath to come. You know, we, we know the gospel. Uh, we know that Christ is coming. We, we rejoice in this. Amen. We love the Lord. We, 
we glorify God and we worship God and we gather and we fellowship and we rejoice together. Um, but I want us to understand that because, you know, the Bible doesn't just preach about heaven. The Bible preaches about hell. It teaches about the, the day of the Lamb, the wrath of the Lamb. There's going to be a day. If we read Revelation chapter 6, all of Revelation, most of it. But if we read Revelation chapter 6, there's a time called the tribulation when God will pour out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting and sinful world. Scorpions are released. Hundred-pound hailstones are coming down, down and, and crashing, crashing and destroying, and destroying things. things. Water turns to blood. Islands disappear. There's starvation, plagues, war, famine. It's going to be a hellish time where people are going to cry out, who shall save us from the day of the wrath of the Lamb? This shouldn't necessarily scare you, but it should motivate you. Motivate you to live with Christ in your heart. Motivate you to share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because I want to tell you something, we get to skip this. The Lord tells us that we'll be caught up in, in uh, I believe it's in Thessalonians, right? Yes, in Thessalonians, uh, not chapter one because we didn't read it. But um, in the book of Thessalonians, the, the Bible tells us that we will be caught up. The rapture will happen. That's that phrase translated. In the clouds with Jesus Christ. You know, if God saved uh, the people from Egypt, if God saved uh, uh, or destroyed the city of Sodom and Gomorrah and, and, uh, and, and saved his people from there, um, don't you think he would save us from this day of wrath? It would be inconsistent to believe that we will have to go through all the wrath, go through all the pain and all the suffering that was not meant for us. Praise God. We accept Christ and we believe in him whom the Father sent. And then like the Thessalonians, you will find yourself turning from idols of our present day. You will be laboring under the burden of love and you will be waiting for the Son with joyful hope. Amen? This is our text. This is our word for tonight. Be careful, Christian. If we could all rise to our feet, we're gonna close here. Let's all uh, close our eyes and bow our heads. Have you been showing works of faith? Have you been laboring in love? Have you been hoping for his return? I want us to use just this short amount of time. No altar call, no, no noise, no music. Just you and the Lord right now. And ask yourself these three questions. Have you been showing works of faith? Have you been laboring in love? And have you been hoping for his return? Just right now, you and the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus. Let's pray.